five, four, three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to Life in the Foam, the podcast about living outside of mainstream media bubbles. I'm Clinton, here with a very special episode, my uh, report on the Many McLuhan's Symposium that was held on the 21st of September, 2018, which is almost a month ago. I had the great fortune to attend and uh, celebrate the designation by UNESCO, which is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, uh, the dedication of the Library of Marshall McLuhan to the Register of Memories of the World. Basically, the UN wanted to recognize McLuhan's books as very important cultural artifacts, which they were. Um, so I showed up armed with my pocket chip, running Audacity, uh, doing audio interviews with people. I showed up with my video camera and I recorded as many talks as I could. It was uh, awesome to actually touch base with the uh, crowd, with the, the scene, as it were, um, of McLuhan scholarship, which I've only been indirectly engaging on my own through reading and uh, watching videos and historical footage of McLuhan. So it was just great to actually touch ground, touch base um, with this interesting group of people and uh, record many talks. Uh, this episode, uh, I've gone through the footage several times now and I've tried to find a way through it. This isn't chronological, this isn't the order of events, but I think this is the best way to lay out my thoughts and feelings to, uh, on uh, the day and on Marshall McLuhan in general. So uh, to start this off, I'd like to begin with a talk by Andrew McLuhan, son of uh, Eric McLuhan, um, son of Marshall McLuhan. Uh, Andrew spent like 18 months going through the library and cataloging all of Marshall McLuhan's books to be brought to the Rare Book Library. Um, and so he gives some, some uh, background on that adventure and more uh, right here at the McLuhan Symposium and now on Life in the Foam. When I was a boy in the 80s or early 90s, bear with me, I'll be brief, I realized that granddad was some sort of a big deal at one time. There came a point in my teens when I decided I would see what that was all about, and I dove into Marshall's seminal work, Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man. I didn't get very much from it, and basically gave up in frustration, followed by your typical teenage rebellion sort of thing, fueled a bit by punk rock. And my attitude, if anyone asked me, and they did, what Marshall McLuhan meant by the medium is the message was to basically suggest they go read a book and leave me alone. <laughs> Maybe I was a little less polite. I spent the better part of two years on my inventory of Marshall's books. It could have been done much faster, I'm sure, but not by me, because it did become very personal. It was just two and a half years old when Marshall died. I don't really have any personal memories of him. I'm very fortunate that there is a vast amount of audio and video documenting him in speeches, interviews, conversation. Not many of us who grew up in the 20th century have that luxury, although people today certainly do. But in working on his library, I really got to know him in a personal way, and any of you who care to or are able to take the time to spend some hours in the collection can get a taste of that too. When you look through any one of his annotated books here, it's the author, Marshall, that's a very special thing. This is more than simply an inert collection of books. They were Marshall's collaborators. The library was his workshop, and he used his tools thoroughly, and rarely did any gather dust, but rather were honed. Libraries are alive. They are living things. The potential in Marshall's library has barely had its surface scratched. There are a lot of things in there which Marshall left to be picked up and explored by the next adventurous reader. Perhaps I am typical of my generation, a part and participant of the new social environment, in that I am committed to sharing my family's work in history with friends in the world, much as the Fisher Library is in having this collection as open to the public as any provincial park. For me, that has meant giving presentations like this at any opportunity, but also sharing through social media, the blog, inscriptorium.wordpress.com, the at MM Reads Books Twitter account where I tweeted his marginalia, a newer Twitter account, McLinstitute, on Facebook through my McLuhan Institute page on Instagram, 
basically any way I can think of to spread the message, and by any means available. So if you're interested in this ongoing project, please follow along. I would like to conclude by expressing my deep gratitude to everyone who has helped me in my own journey, but particularly to everyone involved in achieving the UNESCO designation of the McLuhan Collection as part of the memory of the world. This designation declares that these materials, product of the life and work of Marshall McLuhan, are of significant value to the entire world, that they are worth preserving and worth exploring. It also suggests that the library and the work of Marshall McLuhan might reach more people, especially more people who will work with it and develop it, because there is much more work to be done. I can't name everyone, so I won't single anyone out, but thank you to everyone who helped bring about um, this. You know who you are, and please know that I am deeply grateful for your efforts. Uh, and I already prefaced this, but before I close, I would like to take a moment to remember my father, Eric, whose library this was. He took care of it, used it well, and ultimately made the decision to share it with the world. I know he wouldn't have cared for this event. He would have preferred to stay home in the scriptorium with his dog, Finnegan. But it meant a lot to him that his father's work had achieved such significant recognition by UNESCO. Thank you. One of the questions I was here was, was there a particular piece of indecipherable scribble that was especially agonizing? I mean, did, I mean did, did Eric help you with some of that as well, in terms of, I mean, Eric must have known some of the short forms that yeah. his father was using. So. Yeah. Um, it does take a while to, to get the hang of his writing. Um, I think I can read pretty much most of it. It's not so much being to read the various words, but to understand what the hell he was talking about. Because some of those, and I, I put some of them up, but like, we can't seem to escape a flip-flop. Okay? Uh, you know, the uh, emperor or empire of ice cream. Okay? Uh, you know, all these, all these things that, you know, without the context, they're crazy. And that's part of the fun I had putting them up on Twitter was that, you know, what the heck does that have to do with anything? Um, and it's a good thing that they, they are where they are in the books and they remain there. To, to give you that context and maybe try and understand what he was going on a bit. But that was Marshall's genius and his madness was the connections that he made between things. Um, they're sometimes funny and sometimes very strange. What I find most striking is uh, Andrew saying that these books were Marshall's collaborators. It's a very involved, interactive way of looking at reading. Indeed, that is why I've been obsessed with Marshall McLuhan for the past year, has been that reading his books, it's a very um, creative, two-way, interactive experience. You can't really engage with the book just by reading it and matching it up to what's going on. It really demands a lot of you. His books do massage you, right? Um, you can get into them. Um, we are very used to thinking of computers and smartphones as interactive media because the software is so dynamic and it responds to what we do, but books themselves, you must look at them as extremely interactive. It may seem, um, it may seem like an exaggeration because it's just a book, it sits there, but uh, as a reader your involvement within them is all important and um, in order to uh, understand books as an interactive medium better, I interviewed Joshua Machiavilla, who is a uh, lecturer at the University of Toronto and a uh, book historian. So here are his thoughts. So your engagement with, with these uh, classical texts, does uh, McLuhan play any sort of role? Well, you, you uh, yes. I mean, a certain, a certain I'm, I'm, I, I do show students items from the McLuhan collection. Mm. Uh, and I tweeted something about this, if you want to look and find out a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, so um, 
I mean, I showed them the Finnegan's Wake, for instance. And what's particularly interesting is um, the extent... First of all, uh, McLuhan has the first edition of Finnegan's Wake. So it's a modern first, and that's really appealing. Um, and there are lots of annotations in the first edition, but what is not to be ignored is the other later edition that he has in the collection. He's actually he's interleaved. Uh, you know, he's inserted in, in, in leaves between um, throughout the book, and then he's added notes on them as well. So, I mean... It provides a, a great sort of talking point to get students uh, in thinking about how books are made and how books can be deconstructed and remade and how they can be used as uh, objects for you know, for communicating you know, with your with a future state of yourself as well as with future generations. Absolutely, yeah. the idea of the annotation of marginalia is eventually you are going to return to the book and you'll you will consult what your previous self thought about. That's an interesting way of looking at uh, interacting directly with a book, which is a medium people don't directly see of as, as uh, interactive. Well, I, I think that, that books are, by their very nature, interactive. The idea, very, the very idea of discontinuous reading, for instance, when we move from the scroll to the codex book, uh, is, is one of finding different strategies for organization and navigation. So... Um, when you have a codex book, you may have a table of context, you may have an index. All of this encourages you to read the book in a different way from as you would encounter a text and where you would have to sort of like read from beginning to end. Uh, another, you know, I think a really interesting point of comparison is that of, I think students really, this really helps students think about, is that of the idea of film. So when you go to the cinema and you watch a film, you're kind of forced to be in your seat. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to leave and, and get more popcorn, then you miss part of the film. There's no, you don't, you lack the ability to stop. Uh, the, the the narration, whereas um, and this is kind of similar to what you have with the scroll. You know, you're reading along. Suppose you want to go to the end. Suppose you stop reading a scroll uh, about the halfway point, uh, and then you want to return to it another day. You have to. It's a really complicated, tough process to you're, get back to where you finished reading. You're rewinding more. Yeah, exa <laughs> exa exa exactly, rewinding quite literally. Um, <laughs> And, I mean, the, the book is, is an incredible piece of equipment. It's incredible technology because it allows you to jump ahead and jump back. And to think about, I mean, the quotation is another important point. So I'm really interested in commonplaces. The idea that uh, early... Um, Early readers wouldn't only annotate their text, but they would annotate other. T you know, they would they would take what they read, and then they would copy it over into notebooks, and they try to organize and try to you know, um, you try to find a way to bring the text together, the commonplaces, so that you could retrieve them in you know convenient, fast manner. Yeah, books can be very involving, and Marshall McLuhan was one of the most involved readers that, I mean, I've ever seen. All of his books are annotated. He wrote in all of them. He had conversations with these books. In the same way that I had conversations with his books. It's kind of like a successive, right, um, development, right? The books just get denser and denser and denser. You read McLuhan, what you're reading is his reading of the books that he read, right? It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, the idea of involvement in a uh, interaction with books as a living medium was uh, greatly expanded upon by a wonderful talk given by uh, Alan Gailey, who uh, is a professor in the Faculty of Information at U of T and director of the Collaborative Program in Book History and Print Culture. So uh, here's a significant segment of his talk involving um, his analysis of Marshall McLuhan's very well annotated copy of Ulysses by James Joyce. So what did Marshall McLuhan do with this book? Well, let's start with an annotated page. This is uh, the beginning of the episode Proteus, and it's, let me get right in here. I hope the details are clear enough. So here's, here's an example of, of Marshall McLuhan as annotator. This is a fairly well annotated page. Um, this is the point in the novel, if, if, uh, if anybody has tried to read Ulysses and then reached uh, this episode, this is where you really have to hang on. Um, this is often the, the, the bailout point for many uh, readers of Ulysses, uh, because you get that first sentence, intellectual modality of the visible, at least that, if no more, thought through my eyes, and so on. This is where, where it really gets cool. 
but it's not easy. This is the kind of a passage that takes some work. So what we can see here are a number of interesting annotations. I'm not going to go through all of them, but even here we have uh, some interesting notes on mediation, intellectual modality, the audible underlying pen. We have um, visual time, I think a note, a reference to King Lear here, and now here, EOM, which I now know means extensions of man. Um, this is just an example of the kind of annotated page that, that can be a, an excellent starting point if you're trying to determine what a reader was interested in. It's when I, when I set this assignment for my students, one of the things I tell them to do is just start by inventorying the techniques of annotation. What were the different sorts of things that the annotator did? Just making notes on the side, as Andrew mentioned earlier. Uh, sometimes it's just a call out with EOM. We have references to another work. One slide I'll pass over fairly quickly, though, is um, when uh, we're looking at annotations. Actually, sorry, I'll come. I'll, I'll, I won't pass quickly as quickly over this one. The other kinds of annotations that you sometimes see in this, uh, in in this, and other uh, books of McLuhan's library are pausing to reflect on the ending of something. What we have here is the ending of Proteus, the ending of that episode of Proteus. Before we move on to the next one. And we have down at the bottom some reflections. I can zoom in a little bit more here. Wheel equals despair equals Buddhism. Man equals hope, these two symbols, and then so on. This looks more like not so much a note made in passing as a pausing to reflect on something that might be useful later. One of the other kinds of phenomena that uh, others in my field have, have written about a lot more, Ian Gadd in particular, is uh, what to make of ambiguous annotations, uh, even annotations or modifications to a book where we, we're not even sure if it necessarily means something. Early modern readers were taught to dog-ear books in ways that didn't just mark that this page is important. Dog-earing for early modern readers, some of them, was a form of pointing to something. So it's entirely possible that the word unsympathetic is significant, and he did not have a pen, and he dog-eared it for this. There's Ian Gadd has gone through all sorts of early modern books looking at even the crease marks to deduce what may be pointed to, or the word unsympathetic may be entirely pointless and meaningless. <laughs> we don't know. This is part of the mystery of, of working with material traces left behind by readers. Is readers are very often elusive. It helps if you know who that reader is. It helps if you've known that reader. Sometimes you have evidence for you. Well, first you have to even decide, is it evidence of something? For what's interesting in the upper right here, this, this is Marshall's writing, is, is, all, is a, a bunch of numbers. These are all the other pages, or many of the other pages, where you can actually see the date confirmed. So this is another kind of annotation where it's not just a thought in relation to the moment. It's also it's an example of radial reading. It's something that's led us into this page, but it's also these are all paths outward to other parts of the book. Ulysses, of course, is a novel made to be read radially. You pass through it, but there are all these connections within uh, within the book, objects, references. Yes, more or less without the blue underlining, which wouldn't have looked very good on the page anyway. So this is the kind of image that we've also seen already in many of Andrew's slides, which is the uh, what Marshall McLuhan was doing in the fly leaves, very often the end fly leaves which is the index. I mean, this is a gold mine if you do annotation studies. It's a gold mine in that it, it invites you in. It doesn't always explain itself, but this is a wonderful kind of information to have here. I'll just zoom into the lower right corner. And here we have an, uh, here we have an index that's been made by a reader. Topical references, page numbers. Again, this is, these are all pointers. This is, this is something that is taking advantage of the codex form of the book. It's, this is a book made to be put into motion. Um, there's all sorts of topics here. The Charge of the Light Brigade, referenced on page 484, typesetters, uh, the shape of the kidney that Leopold Bloom, presumably the one that he purchases in the book, uncloaks impressively. There's also phrases uh, that are referenced back here. And what you can do when you're working with this library is start with these fly leaves and then work your way back and see what's there, and then see if that leads you somewhere else as well. My favorite thing that I've encountered however, is the brown paper wrapper meant to go around the two volumes of the Odyssey Press editions. 
Uh, again, it looks like it was created to be a writing surface. I just love the idea. I walk my dog past the house at Witchwood Park fairly often because I live not far away, and I love the idea of Marshall McLuhan sitting there with scissors and tape making this uh, as, as many of us modify an object. Uh, this is preserved in the collection as well, and it's, uh, it's an example of a reader taking a book and physically modifying it or making a new thing to go with it. So, to come to the end, uh, this is the end of Ulysses, and the end is not the end. What we have here is a transcription of some of Wyndham Lewis's criticism, which Andrew had on the screen earlier. And what I especially like here is that we have also uh, a kind of bibliographic and manuscript performance of the ambiguity of endings. Of course, the most famous ending in the history of English literature, Molly Bloom. I won't read the whole last sentence because it's many, many pages long. <laughs> Molly Bloom, Molly Bloom, thinking of, of uh, Leopold Bloom's original proposal of marriage to her. She says, I could feel my breasts all perfume. Yes, and his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. The ending of the novel. Except Trieste, Zurich, Paris, 1914 to 1921. This was a novel written in exile. So the world comes back into the text. Um, every edition of Ulysses includes that postscript. Trieste, Zurich, Paris. And then the Odyssey Press edition adds the end, in case we were confused. That's not there in the 1922. But what I love most is that here, in what looks like Marshall's hand is 792, it's an invitation to go back in. It's an invitation to keep going. The end is never quite the end. But like Odysseys, like perambulations around Dublin, and I'd like to think like libraries that travel through the world, uh, they can all find some place to call home, and we all hopefully end up there again. Thank you. So yeah, that's how Marshall McLuhan read books. Extremely involved. He was, um, and he, he had a huge library. He spent decades of his life pouring over in all sorts of fields. What was it that he was building? What, what, what was he drawing on? What was he making up? Um, to this I turn to a significant segment of a talk by Dan Adelman, who uh, is an assistant professor of writing and rhetoric at the University of Toronto's in his college. Um, in his talk at the symposium, Adelman explored uh, the historical roots of McLuhan as someone who studied rhetoric and grammar, which are two halves of the medieval trivium, as sometimes opposed to sometimes in marriage with logic or dialectic, the other third of the medieval trivium. So like a thousand years ago, when you were getting an education in Europe, you were learning these three parts. And uh, McLuhan wrote his university thesis at Cambridge, the Nash um, thesis, on this drifting and split and joining between uh, the heart and uh, the tongue, right? Um, and this is sort of... McLuhan's entire bedrock to everything he said. Um, logic versus passion and uh, persuasion. So um, in this talk on rhetoric, Dan Edelman begins by explaining um, how he had uh, always kind of heard of McLuhan but really didn't get it until later. Uh, and that's where he picks it up here for this very interesting and uh, in-depth, this is probably the densest talk that was at the symposium. I got the most out of it on multiple rewatchings, so uh, it's worth paying close attention to. Enjoy. At the University of British Columbia, I found myself once again exposed to both McLuhan's ideas and their cascade of influence on Friedrich Hitler, Kate Hales, Donna Haraway, Achille Bembe, Jody Dean, etc. And this time I was much more receptive. And many of these ideas about media ecology began to take root in my imagination. At around the same time, I also became fascinated with rhetoric, the ancient art of persuasion, and began to study the rhetorical tradition from the Greeks to the Romans to the new rhetoric of the 20th century. And I took acute interest in rhetoric's often antagonistic co-evolution with philosophy, as my studies intensified, 
I began to see what seemed like natural opportunities or conduits to be built between the domains of media philosophy and rhetoric. So I set up to research what was taking place in the incipient field of digital rhetoric, expecting to find these intellectual thoroughfares firmly in place. But to this day, when I've encountered work in the still coalescing field of digital rhetoric, I have largely, but not entirely, been disappointed with the rhetorician's relative obliviousness, or mere lip service to, some of the most innovative contemporary work going on in what we might call the field of media ecology, or media studies, or Kulturwissenschaft, if you're German. By the same token, most scholars working in new media studies, or whatever you want to call it, and that's a contentious issue, um, tend not to veer into the domain of rhetorical studies, and often aren't even aware that McLuhan was a classically trained rhetorician first. Indeed, through McLuhan the rhetorician, I purport, rhetoric played a formative role in early media studies but one that was largely occluded from plain view. Interestingly, uh, this issue of rhetoric's exclusion and concealment from the light of day was actually the subject of McLuhan's Cambridge PhD project. When I exhumed McLuhan's dissertation, I was amazed to encounter his interest in what we might call philosophy's systematic excommunication of rhetoric. In his doctoral project, McLuhan explored Renaissance debates about the place of rhetoric in a humanistic education. And some of this actually resurfaces in the laws of media. Without delving too deeply into the matter, I just point out that he zeroed in on a Renaissance era debate about the role of rhetoric in the early humanities and sympathized with the views of a then relatively obscure Renaissance figure named Thomas Nash about the inextricable interwovenness of rhetoric with philosophy and language studies, a configuration known as the trivium, uh, not because it's trivial, but because of three, three elements. During Nash's time, rhetoric was being derogated and disparaged as mere ornamentation, and it was aggressively subordinated to philosophical logic especially in the lead-up to the Enlightenment and the lionization of reason over everything tainted by association with the passions and the subjective imagination. Am I going too quickly? Okay, good. So, years, in fact, before Derrida's important work on Plato's pharmacy, what McLuhan brought into relief was a fascinating narrative about rationalistic philosophies historical exclusions, its rationalizations, its fantasies, its ideology. Going back to the inception of the Western philosophical tradition, both McLuhan and Derrida dwell on the fact that the Socratic philosophical approach begins with a valorization of reason over persuasion, feeling, media, and narrative as just one of the elements that Plato Socrates expels from his imagined republic, rhetoric joins the esteemed company of writing, theater, poetry, affect, and democracy, not to mention race, gender, and class, which we should talk about, but we won't have time for. In this vein, I got to thinking about the historical exclusion of rhetoric from the world of theory. Of course, when Plato was aggressively expelling rhetoric from the philosophical fold, he was doing so as the commander of a combative techne. It's an interesting word, uh, or what we might call a discipline, that was jockeying for position along what he viewed as a fraught terrain of disciplinary and technological rivals to philosophy. And as philosophers uh, Simon Critchley and Judith Butler suggest, Perhaps the ultimate disciplinary rival and doppelganger of philosophy was rhetoric, as exemplified by Socrates' famous rival, Gorgias, the sophist. 
In his dialogue, Gorgias, Plato frames Socrates' rival, Gorgias, as a sort of eloquent snake oil salesman of the sophists. Which is why to this day, when you accuse someone of sophistry, it's a term of disparagement, it's an epithet. Now, for Socrates, the sophists are a camp whose infidelity to the truth and manipulation of the masses' emotions need to, put, need to be put squarely in the philosophical crosshairs. And this partisan disciplinary conflict should lead interdisciplinary intellects like us to wonder, why should rivalry of this sort, however one-sided, be necessary between disciplines that have so much common ground and cross-pollination? In fact, New rhetorician Kenneth Burke offers the perspective that rivalry isn't at all necessary between philosophy and rhetoric. While philosophical ideologues have endeavored to subordinate rhetorical persuasion, among other elements, to philosophical rationality, we could just as easily flip the script. And Burke zooms out facetiously and avers, if we were so inclined, we could view philosophical dialectics as merely another form of rhetoric. Bring several rhetoricians together, let their speeches contribute to the maturing of one another by the give and take of question and answer. And there you have the dialectic of a platonic dialogue. But there are countless opportunities for common ground rather than rivalry and subordination. And by common ground, this is actually a rhetorical principle, carving out common ground, shared substance. When we talk about common ground between media philosophy and rhetoric, we're talking about osmosis rather than collapsing them into each other. Or so I hope. Burke's massive body of work. With his sensitivity to symbolic ecology, almost single-handedly instituted a watershed moment for rhetoric. The new rhetoric migrated theoretical understandings of persuasion from the Greco-Roman nexus of the orator intentionally persuading their audience to that of a mediatic milieu. He even refers to rhetoric explicitly as a medium. Burke's rhetorical universe consists of fraught symbolic ecosystems wherein identifications, mutual accommodations, seductions, desires, orientations, affects, and inculcations circulate wildly and butt up against each other, often irrespective of the intentionality or agency of any one rhetorical subject. In very recent history, these disciplinary worlds, that of rhetoric and that of media theory, these two ways of talking about material symbolic environments have begun to collide and congregate in some interesting ways. Though they are still somewhat alien bedfellows. Um, one such encounter between these technes, these disciplines, has emerged in the nascent domain of what sometimes goes by the name of algorithmic rhetoric. Loosely speaking, algorithms are what we usually refer to colloquially as code. Recursive subroutines that instruct our devices how to solve problems and respond to the world. Exploring the way that algorithms constitute symbolic environments in the digital 21st century, algorithmic rhetoric articulates the contours of contemporary ecomedia. The term ecomedia names the recursive, reciprocally co-constituting relation between what we tend to think of as natural environments and cultural environments in phenomena ranging from GPS navigation to the use of dating apps like Tinder to the ever-evolving theaters of drone warfare and cyber attacks. In any event, my fleeting account of algorithmic rhetoric barely scratches the surface of just one of many possible encounters between the legacies of McLuhan and Burke. 
I was considering talking about another, but I think we're out of time. So I'm just going to pull the plug and thank you for listening. <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, it's hard to say. It's hard to say uh, there's going to be a terrible fight over it because there are people like Paul Levinson who absolutely don't want any kind of regulation because it smacks of censorship. And once you start reg regulating, uh, can censorship be far behind when you start saying what people can put up and say or do and what they can't. So that's a serious problem. I think that's going to have to be hashed out in, in these kinds of conferences and new centers and that are set, being set up, set up for media, um, uh, digital ethics, media ethics. Now, one of the most notable, interesting things about McLuhan is that uh, most of his writing takes place within the subjective mind. He talks a lot about our senses. It's all sort of writing from deep within your own head. And um, involving technology, I was really hungry to hear someone talk about this deeply subjective perspective of McLuhan's within a modern technological sense. And uh, I was not disappointed. I, there was a fantastic discussion given by Dr. Rhonda McEwen, um, who is a professor of the, at the Institute of Communication, Culture, Information, and Technology at the iSchool of University of Toronto. And um, her talk on synesthesia was fantastic. And uh, I can only provide a couple snippets of it here for time constraints, but uh, she um, really elaborates a lot of the uh, contemporary neuroscience and cognitive behavioral science um, underlying uh, our involvement with computers and media and uh, Twitter even. So uh, it was really a highlight of the talk. Uh, here's Dr. Rhonda McEwen. Today I study electrical signals in our brain delivered by our sensory apparatus, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, particularly our skin. I am currently studying the implications of the signals sent to our brains by our skin and how the signals from the neurons affect the way we understand. Signals causing signals and mediation. It's the very spirit of my work. James Katz is a prominent mobile media scholar. He uses the term apparatus to describe the ways that people develop relationships with their technologies and how they seek to find transcendental, transcendental ways to communicate. Apparatigeist, as a word, loosely translates to the spirit of the machine. Spirit of the machine extending to us and or the machine as extensions of us. McLuhan said, I am working from the observation that our technical media are extensions of our senses. The latest such, such extension, television, I am suggesting, is an extension not of sight and sound, but of that very synesthesia that which artists of the past centuries have stressed as accessible via tangible tactile values of a new vision. Television is not just sight and sound, but tangibility in its visual, contoured, sculptural mode. What have been the social effects, what, sorry, what have been the social effects of this sudden extension of our sight touch powers? What have been the specific changes in our attitudes to public space, to privacy, and to the nature of environmental materials resulting from television, end quote. A new vision that is imbued with tactile properties. In my experimental research, I asked what is the nature of the signal delivered through the fingers and the eyes to the brain? And what do the signals in the brain do with that? When we touch a tablet, what are the implications for our understanding? What are the specific changes in our attitudes to ourselves and each other when we tap out messages on Facebook or Snapchat? When spirit meets signal, what is the product of this new vision? Flash, spirit, plex, stretch. Plex. Plex is an important suffix in telecommunications. In a full duplex system, it describes simultaneity for two people talking with each other. Our phones are full duplex, so we can reduce, or in the case of interruptions, negate the time between listening and speaking. This was a revolution in analog media. We made it faster. We could speak at the same time. Then came multiplexing, which was a method by which multiple analog digital signals 
are combined into one signal and shared over media. Multiple signals combined now. So many simultaneous conversations. More content on the same channel achieving crazy speeds on optical networks. Link efficiencies are calculated by multiplying the time to watch a frame, which in itself is media, right? Uh, which is a digital transmission unit, and we multiply that by the number of frames and divide the result by the total time spent sending data. You reduce the time spending, uh, sending that data and we get glorious efficiency and extremely high speeds. A fun fact about information traveling from the skin to the brain. The brain registered, registers pain slower than it does excitement. Think about that. So pain comes slowly or slower than other kinds of information to the brain. The dorsal column medial lumbical pathway includes wider diameter axons with fewer synapses conveying tactic, tact, tactile and kinesthetic information for planning and executing rapid movement, where quick feedback is a must. All that means to say is that we get excited very quickly and we are engineered for that to happen. Whereas the spinothalamic pathway includes a number of synapses from within the spinal cord, slowing down conduction while providing a mechanism for inhibiting pain perception. This is necessary. This is self-protection because you might need to run before you actually feel how bad this pain really is. So the idea in the body was Let's fight first or save ourselves first and feel that pain later. Our, our physiology, in our physiology we know that speed is not always more important. The Urban Dictionary Plex means to fight. It speaks about friction, flame wars online, speed in responses to comments, emails, quick, often thoughtless tweets. Speed to respond in an ideological fight. McLuhan said, town planners are familiar with the new lines of force exerted upon already existing urban spaces by faster vehicles, by air travel. Um, on a more personal level, the already existing habits of visual perception are today being radically modified by electric, sorry, electric information movement. Four, the instantaneous creates an entire field of relations where before had been only a segment or a fragment, or a single point of view, right? So the instantaneous creates an entire field of relations where before had only been a segment, a fragment, or a single point of view, end quote. Multiplexing single points of view as fast as we can to create fields of niche interest groups, splinter fractions, a multiplicity, all speaking at the same time and no one listening. Speed up the excitement. The pain will come much later. McLuhan said, innumerable confusions and a profound feeling of despair invariably emerge in periods of great technological and cultural transformations. Our age of anxiety is in great part the result of trying to do today's job with yesterday's tools, with yesterday's con con concepts. He also said, if our massive new electric media are direct extensions of sight and sound and touch, there is, is there not an urgent need to consider a possibility of a consensus or racial and balance among these for our collective sanity? Even the slight disturbance of the balance among our private senses can drive us to our wits. We live in a time when whole peoples have gone out of their wits when impelled by a new massive form such as radio. Psychologists explain that when the field of attention has center without margin, C slash M, we are hypnotized, end quote. So I leave you with this. Let us collectively stretch and wake up from this hypnosis. Let us examine our inferences and use the full spectrum of the sensorium to locate and act upon the transformative processes currently underway. Flash, spirit, flex, stretch. Thank you. There you go. Uh, James Katz, the editor of uh, several volumes of, uh, of uh, academic literature on computers and communications technology and their role in shaping society uh, under his concept of apparatigeist, 
has been I've been looking into that stuff and it's fantastic it's wonderful and so um, that alone was a, a wonderful gift um, for at least for my intellectual curiosity and moving forward with this podcast so that's great um, there's so much great stuff at this conference um, but uh, I'm out of time so I'm gonna close with uh, some excerpts of uh, the talk by um, Michael McLuhan, son of Marshall McLuhan, which I think is a wonderful way to end off this episode. Uh, here he is with uh, Reminisce's idea and insight. I want to go back a bit in history. Uh, sometimes people uh, like me to come and, and, and share anecdotes, and I'm not doing that for this reason, but um, uh, last night, after uh, speaking with uh, uh, John Durham Peters, he was asking me a lot about life at home, and I was uh, I, I wrote these notes last night. Uh, when Armstrong stepped onto the moon, that was on Dad's birthday in 1969. We were in the living room, and it was broadcast live. It was a pretty astounding moment. One of those real game changers, you know. He turned to me, and um, he said, "And th this is a rough quote that you know I, it's the best I could do last night after four glasses of wine." No one will live another life like mine. And I think he was talking about his generation. I grew up with horses and buggies. Then came the motor car. He always called cars the motor car. And then the aeroplane, British spelling. Now we walk on the moon. No one will have another life like this. You know, there was awe in his eye, and it was very rare that he was moved to that extent, but I think he saw the scope of what this one life provided. And uh, my life, which uh, started in 1952 and has run to the present, has seen tons of change, but nothing like that. You can imagine uh, what that last generation uh, has gone through. Now, in this milieu, Ten years earlier, we were uh, visiting my grandmother in Fort Worth, Texas, and I remember seeing not only huge mosquitoes, the biggest ones I'd ever seen in my life, I thought they were just uh, horrific, but also uh, burned into my memory is the image of two water fountains on uh, the wall of a downtown building, and uh, one chipped and dirty was labeled colored. and. Another spiffy newer one, right beside it, slightly higher, was labeled white. That's the world in which these things were written. He was writing the Gutenberg Galaxy when Kennedy was shocked. During the time, uh, no, he was writing the Gutenberg Galaxy then, when we were down in Texas, sorry. During the time Kennedy was shocked, uh, he was getting understanding media ready for the publishers. By the time of the lunar landing, he had created, with others, the field we know today as media ecology. And he's changed the way we perceive the environments that are created by the technology we sell our lives and souls to daily. We are an enslaved generation. I'm not a Luddite, but I do believe that. I've, I've learned how to turn things off. Dad told me once, I may be wrong, but I am never in doubt. And he, he proved that to me many times over our lives. And, and I was asked last night uh, how much of a father he was. So it, that got me to thinking too. And um, it's all your fault. <laughs> I have never known a more intelligent, educated, focused, or insightful man. And uh, as you have heard from Rob, we had visitors that were fill the house with intelligent, insightful people. But um, Dad was in a class of, those, uh, of his own. And uh, the only one I've seen that comes close is Arnold Twinebee. And uh, you won't be that impressed. He's in a story, and I said, I'm sure you all know because of the library. But um, Toynbee's mind would tie things over thousands of years together in a single sentence and show how they were all related. And that's what Dad did. Dad came at it uh, from the viewpoint of a poetry scholar and Elizabethan literature scholar, toying me by studying the ebb and flow of the tides of history. 
Um, he was extremely generous with his time and his money, and he would help any who asked that came to his door. If you needed to, uh, to have someone to run interference with a bureaucrat, he would do his best. He was formidable and fearless, and I say that on, on uh, my own uh, behalf there. But I also wanted to mention one thing, because it just struck me when I saw um, Rob's slide with the, uh, the handwriting, which um, is a little more decipherable to me today, but it was pretty hieroglyphic back in, in our day. Do you realize how easy that made to, uh, that was to uh, craft letters to your teacher? <laughs> and his signature was damn close to print as well. And um, it, it made it an exciting life, and I don't think I was believed often, but uh, I didn't quite have his vocabulary down. In short, he was my only father, and I do not want or need another. It's really hard when somebody asks you, what's it like being the son of Marshall McClellan? Because we lack context as children to tell you what's it like to be the son of the guy next door who repaired cars. I don't know. I really don't know. My life to me was normal. Um, uh, I have lived a much more normal life since, and I realized maybe it was a little more verified than I first thought. So, in closing, I am going to close, sir. I'm going to close. In closing, we remember how the ideas were birthed. And I think when people are studying McLuhan and the importance of explorations and bringing it back as a brought back context, we see so many of the writings, especially the pithy aphorisms, the, 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 the Twitter-friendly single-line quotes out of the context that they were initially created in. Remember when they were created, what gave them birth. The mechanical bride of the Korean War, the breaking of segregation in the 50s, explorations, Gutenberg galaxy and understanding media, the racial unrest that was rampant and the rise of the student movements. These things are things you don't think about when you are reading those materials. And this is the garden in which these thoughts arose. When he used the term neighbor, for instance, and I've seen some criticisms of this, uh, you know, about the last couple of years, people saying he was racist, this, that, and the other thing. It's the same year Martin Luther King used the term Negro. You know, this was not a bad word until the Black Power Movement came around a couple of years later and we referred to black people instead of Negro. It, this is so critical. He saw the global village not as a hippie utopia, but as a world of internecine conflict and violence. And that he emphasized to me over and over because I was a hopeless hippie. <laughs> this is worn out. Serbia, Somalia, and Saudi Arabia today. I just picked those three countries because they start with an S. It is not an aggrandizement of white Eurocentric culture over the ethnic, ethnic diversity of the rest of the world. It's everywhere. It is caused by the collapse of literacy and the privacy of the individual and the subsequent loss of identity. Oral culture is usurping the primacy of print as electronic communications become more pervasive. The Twitter universe embodies the group hive and tribal mindset. The foothold of literacy is shaken with the rise of every Trump and Ford. We live in the world that dead foresaw. The difference is that his precepts are now our lives. The world is smaller. The internet exists. He just talked about it in the movie podcast. Everyone has a computer. You know, again, I have to do a side thing. It, when he told this to IBM, they were asking, you know, on a consultation, and he said, well, there's going to be a time when every household has a computer. And they said, that's nonsense. Nobody's going to devote a room of their home to a computer. And that was just in 1966 or 7 or something like that. Dad's work is ubiquitous and has shaped our lives and our culture. UNESCO recognizes this, and this conference embodies this. Enjoy your day. Well, that'll have to be the last word here on Life in the Fall. It was wonderful to step out of my own media bubble and directly into 
the world of McLuhan Studies all gathered together at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. A fantastic privilege. Thank you to uh, everyone involved in uh, helping me out there. Um, until next time, when we get back to our live interview format, I hope you take care and uh, stay safe in the wild maelstrom of media.